Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 287, featuring a review of Pillars of Eternity, the new game out from Obsidian Entertainment. It promises to be the spiritual successor to the Baldur's Gate, Icewind Dale, uh, Planescape Torment, those uh, beloved Infinity Engine games that uh, we grew up playing in the, in the 90s. Uh, it just came out last month. Finally got a chance to complete it and uh, do a review of it. Anyway, there's a lot of great stuff to talk about with this game. So without further ado, here is Pillars of Eternity. And here we go. Pillars of Eternity. One hell of a game and exactly the type of game that I am all about. Computer role-playing game. Old school style, but with modern sensibilities. As you probably know, this project was announced back in 2012 in Kickstarter. They raised their $1.1 million goal in 24 hours, and the hype has been building from there. I've had a lot of the designers and developers that worked on this game on my show. I've interviewed them. Uh, the director, in fact, Josh Sawyer, you can go back and watch that. I've also interviewed both Chris Avalon and Tim Kane. I mean, this was a hell of a team they had here. They had a 1.6 million dollar Kickstarter budget to work with, and, no and it's just there's no reason for this game to fail, really. But the question is, does it live up to the legacy? Is Pillars of Eternity as good of a game, if not better, than Baldur's Gate, Nicewind Dale, and Planescape Torment? Where would we put that? Uh, how would it rank compared to those those greats? So stay tuned to this video, and you will hear one man's opinion. Now one thing you'll notice right away about this game is it's all about choices. You are constantly making very involved choices and very meaningful choices beginning with the difficulty level of the game. So not only do you have easy, normal, hard, and path of the dead, uh, you also have a expert mode and <laughs> the trial of iron. Basically turns it into a uh, permadeath uh, roguelike sort of experience. So. Lots of hardcore options here. I played it on normal the first time through, and that was a significant challenge. But uh, you know what? I'm going to go hard this time, because I'm a glutton for punishment. Wouldn't it be an achievement, though, to actually complete it on hard or that path of the damned? Nice little way to start the game here. You know, they didn't have the budget for those big Hollywood-esque, uh, full-on 3D cutscene type uh, segments, but they really didn't need them, and I, I think it's probably a better game for the lack of those things. And there's our loading screen. I have this installed on my SSD, so hopefully it will be relatively quick. Five wagons grope blindly for the path on a starless night, their master glancing ever upward to the skies for assurance that he is on the right course. A dim lantern, his only protection against the encroaching darkness. But the skies bring no comfort shining no light, betraying no hint of what they know. The caravan carries travelers bound for the frontier hamlet of Gilded Vale, you among them, where a local lord has offered land and wealth to settlers from abroad looking for a fresh start. You have taken suddenly ill, sweating and shivering, and one of the other travelers signals for the caravan master to stop on your behalf. He pulls up just in time to avoid plowing into the trunk of a fallen tree that bars the way ahead. You will go no further tonight. I love that narrator's voice on that. Kind of got almost an Oregon Trail-like vibe to it there for a minute, huh? Kind of happened. wonder if we might get dysentery at some point. That would be fun. All right, we've got characters to create. Actually, only one character. You can actually create a whole party of uh, your own custom <laughs> creations, but... At the beginning, you only get to create your main character. And there are lots of choices to be made, and they will have a serious impact on how you play the game, how you interact with characters. Uh, you'll get into lots of little situations, sort of like uh, uh, scenarios you might encounter in a tabletop game. Oh, I've got the Navi here, I see. Don't know anybody to tell James Cameron, but I think they ripped him off. There's our dwarf. 
Yeah, some of these class, uh, races are this typical uh, fantasy tropes, I guess. You got your elf and your dwarf and uh, <laughs> or land. <laughs> I guess that's a, a hobbit. Uh, there's the uh, what? What the heck is that? Godlike. Damn, that's just an ugly, dude. <laughs> oh man, he's he's probably perfect for that path of the damned. I'm gonna go with the good old dwarf. You know, I like dwarves. They they like good ale, big axes, and gold caves. You know, how can you go wrong with that? They have big beards. Look at that beard. <laughs> Mountain dwarf and boreal dwarf. Boreal, boreal. <laughs> Probably should know how to pronounce that. Oh, uh, what's the difference between these two? I kind of like the look of this mountain dwarf. I'm just going to go <laughs> uh, aesthetically for that choice. Now look at all of these classes, man. What, what do we got there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 1, 2, 3. Yeah, 11 classes. Some of these, again, are fairly well-known, well-traveled classes. Paladin, Ranger, Wizard, and so on. And you also have some interesting choices. Cypher, Enchanter. I think the Chanter is more or less a bard. Uh, the Cypher here is kind of interesting. Not quite sure what they are. I haven't played with the, with the Cypher yet. The ability to directly contact and manipulate another person's soul. Huh, interesting. So I guess these guys must be lawyers. Let's go with the Barbarian. Been reading some Conan novels lately, kind of jazzed up about the Barbarian. He's got a some pretty cool abilities, looks like. Carnage. When he hits with melee attacks, they automatically attack other people around. So that that's pretty cool. You will often get into packs of enemies. Very common in this game, so this might actually be a really good choice. He's got uh, two abilities that I could choose from here, a Frenzy and a Yell. Now look at, one of them is uh, one per encounter. That's really nice because uh, the other option is the uh, one per rest or two per... Actually, I think these are both uh, two per encounter. Yeah, these are both uh, per encounter, which is cool. Uh, the problem with the ones that say per rest is that you don't really rest that often in this game. Uh, and if you do, it's, it's kind of a big process. You only get two camping supplies at the hard level. I think you get four on the normal level. Uh, so you won't be using those very much, where if you had the per encounter, you know, you could use that quite a lot. So... I kind of want to go for something that's going to be, you know, more useful more often, I guess. Now, here's our attributes. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky. Uh, if, if you played AD&D, you played Baldur's Gate and all those games, you might think you know what these are, uh, but they've changed it up a little bit just to kind of keep keep you feeling dumb, I guess. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, the biggest thing to be aware of is the might. Because that is what controls the amount of damage that you do. You know, whether you're a spellcaster or a melee guy, you want to pump up the might. Uh, intellect doesn't do the same thing either. You might think that's uh, spell damage, but it just controls area of effect, a couple other things. It's not actually all that useful, uh, believe it or not. So pay attention to that. Look at what the stats do. Don't just assume it's the same as uh, Baldur's Gate, because you will be uh, severely shocked and horrified. Uh, and then we've got a choice of cultures. And, you know, it's, it takes a while if you really sit here and read all these options. And, again, you don't want to just flash through this because it will affect a lot of the game later on. The type of dialogue options you have, uh, the way characters respond to you, it's, it's pretty cool. And they've actually done a really good job, in my opinion, with the lore of the game. You know, I guess they created this whole world just for the game. As far as I know, I don't think it's based on any... Uh, fantasy novels or anything, so they've uh, really packed in a lot of detail. Uh, then we also have our backgrounds. So, again, you know, it's so many ways to customize your character. It's really just cool. I mean, the replay value of this is just through the roof, right? I mean, lots of options. I think I'll go the mercenary. And then we have some basic, uh, you know, basic ways to change our appearance. Uh, again, they didn't really lavish a lot of their money on this. It doesn't have that sort of Skyrim uh, character customizer thing where you, you know, <laughs> you're adjusting like the size of the spread of your nostrils and things of that sort, the, the slope of your forehead. Nothing like that. <laughs> he just basically has some heads we can swap around, some different types of hair, 
trying to figure out which of these hairstyles looks the most barbaric. <laughs> that definitely does not look very barbaric. <laughs> that looks Vidal Sassoon. Oh, what are we going to go with here? That's not too bad. You know, I kind of miss... I, I like always like those uh, Fallout... Is it the Fallout games that they have names for all the different hairstyles and uh, beards? Or is that the Saints Row? One of those kind of games is... They had a lot of fun naming all the different sorts of beard styles. And I always like that. Uh, we don't have a lot of choices in terms of portraits. I guess these guys did not like to pose or something. What is it? We do have some voice ah. options, though. Let's check My those eyes out. Are peeled. Hmm? I shall lead us... Yeah! My eyes are peeled. Ha! Ah, keeping quiet. Huh? Follow me. <laughs> he won't see me coming. Now I am the leader of the group. He won't see me coming. Yeah, not, not bad. Pretty good spread of options there. Uh, I will say a little bit of a negative thing about the game. Don't, don't throw anything at me, guys. But uh, you will hear a lot of these voice samples. <laughs> Many. Many times. <laughs> it does get a bit annoying. It's possibly even worse than in the old Baldur's Gate games. So uh, just be aware of that. Try to find the voice that you find least irritating because you will hear it a lot. Everybody stays close to the wagons, got it? Stay out of the woods, and beasts take you if you were planning a stroll through those ruins up there. Yeah, this guy, he doesn't read his lines very well. Whole area's crawling with hut-dwelling types who'd be happy to stick an axe in you for trespassing. So mind that you don't track mud on their sacred blazing rocks. Tonight, everybody stays put, and in the morning, we'll get the path cleared. Gilded veils less than a day out. Understood? Touch of the rumbling rot, could be. There's a stinging beetle around here carries it. You'll be fine once it passes your innards. Unless you don't drink water, of course. In which case you'll be dead in a day. Oh man, I was right There's about the Oregon Trail. Part, I got dysentery! Called a springberry, about the size of a fingernail. Give you cramps if you eat it, but the frontiersmen make a tea from it. Calms the insides. Should get you through the night. You might check around, see if you can find some. Meanwhile, I'll see if we can scare you up some water. Scare you up some I water, I know you want to hunt before it gets much darker. But see about refilling our water first. Got a sick one here. And thus begins the quest for the Dingleberry. This guy, Cody Lundin. They grow on a bush that's common around here, kind of funny looking. You'll know it when you see it. Doubt you'd have to go far off the road to find one. Hold on. Take someone with you. I know you're not some helpless tenderfoot, not like most of this lot. But you drop dead, I don't want to be looking for the body. Got a schedule to keep. I still think he should be reading this Kalisha. in the country accent. Kalisha! He needs to find some spring berries. Watch that he doesn't drop dead. No promises. What kind of guide says something like that? Kind you can afford. Ooh, snap. Don't listen to her. You're in good hands. And I pay too well, if anything. Off with you. Hayden should have supplies. See that you're equipped before you head out. We're in harsh country. Get your berries and hurry back. And if you get so much as a tickle of wind, you drop everything and you run. A Something tickle in the of wind. Oh, if it's a beewick, we'll shelter in the ruins. Hut dwellers be damned. Well, you should have smelled you my beewick. Let's get going before you keel over. Oh, I'm about to keel over. Oh, I get to search for berries. Oh my god. Let's go. Where's the berry? <laughs> yeah, not the most uh, fascinating way to begin the game, but uh, it gets better. Let's take a look at our characters here. Got some coolio. Gear, oh, is it Cloak of the Obsidian Order? Pretty sure Josh Sawyer wears one of those to work. Now we got a ring, Gon's Pledge. I'm wondering if this might be some Kickstarter rewards. So I notice all my char new characters had this stuff. And there's our Kalisha. <laughs> Spoiler alert, don't get too attached to old Kalisha. I'll see it done. Ah, that's locked. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I mentioned this, you don't have to be a rogue to pick locks. You know, anybody can learn the mechanic skill or use up a bunch of lock picks to try to do it. So, I guess the, the rogue is just pretty much a damage Secure. dealer. Probably pretty good at stealth. I never played a rogue. I haven't played a rogue yet, so I don't really know what that's that's like. But 
any of you guys playing rogues, uh, let me know what you think. It's a fun class. Yeah, what's this? Got some mana regen. The uh, hit points and health system in the game is a little different than what you might be used to. And, uh... As you wish. Anyone need supplies? Brought a whole wagon full of goods to sell, but not enough shirts for the road. Say, is there anything you need? I've got some basic traveling supplies for sale if you'd like to take a look. One interesting thing about the game is instead of having that old uh, inventory system where you weigh down your characters and they run out of spaces or they get too heavy and encumbered, uh, they have this thing called a stash. I guess it's basically like a bag of holding. You can just put anything you want to in there, as much stuff as you want. It doesn't weigh your characters down and you can get stuff out. You can't do it in combat, but you can do it when you're not in combat. So I think that's a pretty cool idea. You know, it doesn't... See I'm not done. quite sure how it's supposed to work in the... If there's any logic, yeah, logical way they can explain way. that within the game. <laughs> Didn't really look into that, but it definitely makes life easier. You know, I noticed they had a director's commentary option on one of the menus. That might be fun to try at some point. I'll have your water soon enough. Stream's not going anywhere. Yeah, I'm not going to get you no water. <laughs> Even though you're about to die from the runs. As to why I can't just get some water myself. Uh, it's like we I can't go anymore that way. Okay. Let's it feels like it's up. about time for some combat. Yep, there we go. What do we got? What kind of rat is this? What kind of rodent specimen are we about to take out? What is that thing? Wolf! Don't you guys ever listen to me? Not in wolf. A wolf. Oh well. It's kind of I could sort of squint a little bit and sort of pretend it's a rat. Oh boy, what is all this? Information. Accuracy, deflection, damage reduction. Uh, it's actually a lot of a lot of mechanics here you'll have to master if you really want to min-max this. It's uh not quite as I don't know if I'm just more used to the old AD&D style. I, I found this a little tricky to wrap my head around sometimes, but I think I thought that. Uh, basically what happens is you'll be switching weapons from time to time because uh, a monster will be more resistant to one type of damage like piercing, uh, but will be vulnerable to say crushing or slashing. So you kind of want to have uh, two or three weapon sets, which is kind of nice. You know, you, you get kind of tired of wielding the same old weapon all the time, right? So. And they also have talents that will spread. So instead of just getting, say, a longsword proficiency or competency in longsword, uh, you just pick a type like ruffian weapons or knightly weapons or whatever. And then you'll, that'll give you uh, basically one of each, at least one weapon of each type of damage. So you can see here how some of those choices you made when you created your character are playing out. So if you picked uh, soldier, I guess you'd have different options than if you picked... Uh, a slave or something. So lots of... It's actually kind of interesting. I, this must be pretty... Uh, must have taken a long time. I'm just trying to imagine that how much dialogue they must have had to create for all of those different possibilities. I mean, there must be a huge script behind this. I wouldn't want to have to translate it. Let's see. He's getting you water anytime soon. Okay, still on with the water. You know, it's, it's definitely starting to feel like Baldur's Gate. You know, it's... I don't know if it's the style of the graphics or just the sort of feel of the interface as you're moving around here. It's almost like the Baldur's Gate muscle memory is clicking on. It's it's really nice. You know, I'm really glad these guys did this. <laughs> and I was so worried I'd never get to play any of these games again that they just... We just have to keep going back to the, the classics. And, you know... So glad they were able to start making these again. Well, where the heck is this guy? Yeah, a little bridge. Pretty cool bridge. Nice. Sparkle went hunting. At least he left the water skins. Come on. Yeah, at least he left the water skins. See, there's uh, this little effect here I really like, too. It reminds me of those old journals, like Pool of Radiance. They tell Sparkle. you to look up something in Are your you journal. Right? Uh oh, what's going on? 
This is not looking good. I think we're about to get into our first combat. I guess we'll see how hard hard is. Ambush. Okay, what do we do here? So we can see his area of effects and him that way. She can knock somebody down. Mm -hmm. now, if she can do this, she'll knock him prone. They won't be able to attack back for a while. I think you can do more damage. So that's a pretty nice ability to have. Bunch of information. You can also look here and see if it says you're grazing with your weapon, that means you they're resistant to that type of damage. So he needs to find something beside a mace to use if he wants to do damage to people uh, like this. And there's also a little almanac or journal, bestiary, and you can look this up if you forget it. But they'll let you know. You'll hear them complaining about their weapons, and that means you need to swap. What is it? So as, as I was saying earlier, now it doesn't have hit points like other games, uh, like the Baldur's Gate series does. Instead, you got this this health, which is that green bar, and then you've got, uh, I think they call them endurance points or stamina points. So if you run out of stamina points, you're, you're basically knocked unconscious. Uh, you can't, you can't, characters can die if they take enough damage. I've had that happen a few times. Uh, but basically, as long as you, uh, if somebody survives the battle, and you defeat all the enemies, you'll come back, but that health bar will be reduced. And the only way to get that to uh, come back up is to rest. Use up your camping supplies. I don't know if I really like th that system too much. I mean, it is necessary for this game because they've got a lot of the of the story elements tied around that, you know, camping and sleeping. So I guess they had to have it in there, but... You know, you, you get into some battles, eventually, uh, no matter how good your healers are, you're going to have to rest. You can't heal all the way back up without sleeping. All right, let's see what else is there. You know, you could turn on... I've, I found a lot of stuff. These, these characters don't have mechanics, I don't believe, but if you boost that up enough, you can turn on stealth mode, and that also doubles as a scouting or searching mode, and you can find... They've, they've really what got lots this? of little stuff hidden all over the place. So it's worth uh, making a sweep uh, fast in stealth mode just to find all the cool little stuff. I'll skip that for now. So this combat's feeling pretty good to me. You know, I really... You know, I'm usually not a huge fan of the real time with pause. Because I feel like it, I lose some control over it somehow. It doesn't feel as tight as the turn-based, but... You know, this one... And, I don't know. It, it, it works for me. I think I actually like the way they did this better than in the... Uh, Baldur's Gate Infinity Engine games. It's a little bit easier to control. You have a slow mode. You can slow, basically put them in slow motion. Uh, you can pause, obviously, and issue orders. I, th I think you might be able to string out some orders. I never really mess with that. It's one at a time is fine for me. Uh, oh, lots of gear there. So now, see, I could uh, hook this guy up with a, this hatchet here, and then he would have a, an alter alternative way to do damage. Now, some of the weapons will have two types of damage, like piercing or crushing or something like that. And those are really nice because it will automatically go with the type that the creature's vulnerable to. So that, to me, is a pretty solid plus trying to decide what weapon to use. Oh, here we are. The Clan Fathen Leaders. handful of dark figures stands above the fallen. So as you can see, things have not gone well here at the camp. We apparently are trespassing. It's the old standoff. So you can see there's lots of lots of dialogue options. Some one of them depends on my lore skill. I kind of want to roleplay this guy as a bit of a jerk. Let's see what kind of reaction we get. Many things may happen. I wonder how they decided on what, which dialogues to hire the voice actors for. It seems like this guy, I'm kind of surprised they didn't have a voice for him. Let's see, oh, lots of, quite a few options there. See, one depends on might, another one for athletics and lore. There's some that are in red, that means I can't select those. I don't meet the, I don't meet the prereqs, but it might be something to consider for another playthrough. All right, this is uh, this might actually get kind of tough here. I got this uh, rogue. I almost forgot hmm? about him. <laughs> he doesn't stay with the party for long. Again, you know, there's going to be some little minor spoilers here. 
Well, I'll try not to spoil too much, but if you're worried about that sort of thing, I just would not even watch this. Just go play the game. How can I help? Now, if you look closely, you can see some green lines connecting me to those uh, hunters there. Basically, I think they call that something like uh, lines of engagement, something like that. And basically, what it means, I can't if I try to run away, uh, they'll get some free swipes, or it just won't be nice. I think I lose a lot of my uh, defensive capabilities when, when that happens. You know, I would have liked to have uh, a little bit more AI options on my characters. You know, a lot of this you have to go in manually, and say, okay, knock, knock somebody down. It would have been pretty cool if you could have just made that a uh, part of the AI and just said, yeah, use that ability every time or set up some s conditions. Because they won't use any of their abilities. And, I mean, it's not a... They're not dumb. Like, you don't have archers running in in the melee range. Uh, you know, something stupid like that. But uh, on the other hand, you, you I didn't see any way to make them stay back. And it would be It would have been nice, nicer just to have a little bit of AI there. Not depend on the manual input quite so much. Like I said, it's not a, it's not unbearable get by inside. any means, but Run! you know some of that stuff. Once you get a full party, I don't know. I mean, it would take a while to go in and manually command everything every time. Thankfully, most battles you don't really need to use that many abilities. But I don't know. Maybe on this hard mode, I might have to really slow down and issue lots of orders. Alright, I guess we're in the midst of this storm. Again, I'm loving this. The way that they're telling the story with this, this sort of papery look. It really reminds me of those, like a Dragonlance book. Or, you know, those old D&D &D campaign manuals, or campaign modules. It's really slick the way they did this. And, I mean, imagine the money that they're saving by doing it this way. No need to have all that uh, custom 3D animation. A good choice doesn't. I mean, some people might look down on that for whatever reason. But works for me. Oh, camera shake. Was that a Buick? Had to be. Those damn Buicks. To be alive. And we're the only ones. Hey, here. There could be another collapse. We're not getting out that way anyway. Let's get further inside. Can you walk? Ah, oh, that Kalisha. Not the nicest guide. It? it just, it really amazes me, the all these options that you have, all the interface options. You can even make your characters look like they have bobbleheads. I mean, <laughs> for God's sake. I won't Christ. spoil that by showing it to you in, the, in this video, but uh, when you get the game, turn it on and uh, see what you think. I don't know if I'd want to play it that way, but it's fun. But yeah, you can turn the stash on and off, make it restrict it. You can make your characters more vulnerable. That should be far enough. But what now? Way out. Storm has to die sometime. Just about every option. Just, I mean, just about everything in the game can be adjusted or turned on or off somehow. Could, could we maybe stay here and rest a few hours? I've lost some blood. It seems quiet off to the left. There might be a place to rest there. This, but we can't afford to stay put. Those Glonfathens were riled about something. Could be we got company in here. Looters will be armed and ready to kill, and there's probably a lot of them. We can't be caught sleeping in their beds. Please, I just need to lie down for a while. Then we can move as fast as you want. Didn't hear me. We are gonna die in here if we don't get moving and get this place figured out before the looters come back. We've either got to find the exit, or a damn good place to hide. Oh boy. Drama. I... I'll do my best. Suck it up! This probably... I think I did the other option last time. Again, I'm trying not to spoil too much of this for you, but That's a we pretty crucial moment back there. Alright, let's see. Crate, hammer, and chisel. That'll, that'll come in useful. As long as you have that in your inventory, you'll get some special options. Come across a crack in a wall or something, I might be able to use that hammer and chisel. Let's see what we got. K 
camping supplies. So that's what we need to rest. The thing about being maimed or wounded, that's the only way to get rid of that. So sometimes your characters will get fatigued as well. And take pretty bad penalties for that. Yeah. So the torch can be a weapon. It's considered a club, I suppose. I'll take care of it. Set people on fire. That ought to come in pretty handy. Stay quiet. Trying to scout out a little bit here and see if I can find some secret treasures or maybe slip up on some bad guys. I think there's a... Yeah, that's this little guy here. A little kobold looking dude. I forget what they're called in this game. It's something kind of strange. Okay, yeah. So if you look under my character there, he's got a little eyeball. <laughs> that didn't take long. I guess this guy doesn't have any stealth, but... You can get some characters, if you have a high enough stealth, I guess you can get right up close to them before they see you. Yeah, so I guess it's trying to give me some options here. I guess I don't have to fight this guy. To fight or not to fight? That's a lizard. A lizard man, okay. I'll tear you to pieces, lizard. Soft clicking sound. <laughs> I just kill him. That shouldn't take long. Although this game does have a habit. You, you just see one dude and think it's going to be a cakewalk. And suddenly seven or eight more come running out from the shadows. That's always fun. Yeah, that guy didn't stand a chance. <laughs> uh, what do we got here? Some more lock picks. There's an option you can set where it turns off the auto stop. So these guys, will remember, they get the free attacks if they run away. Uh, if you turn that off, what you can do is sort of kite enemies. If you get a big pack, you sort of run away for a while, and eventually some of them will go back. But some of them will stay a little bit longer, and you can do that to pick them off one at a time, or a couple at a time instead of, you know, <laughs> eight or nine at a time. Oh, here's a tattered journal. There's lots and lots and lots of books in this game, and there's some pretty lengthy text. I mean, there's a lot you can read. Uh, I'll show you later. There's these uh, special characters that I guess maybe people who pledged this? enough, maybe one of Let's the, I forget the details, but I think they actually uh, players created some of the characters' backstories, or the past lives, I think, and that's kind of interesting. And there's all sorts of monuments that people have left in here. So it really is kind of a product of the community, as well as these developers. Oh, that guy is... I guess the hard's not so hard yet. <laughs> I'm guessing that's going to change. Ah, uh, yeah, there's that hammer and chisel opportunity, but I, I think I might be strong enough just to strong arm this. Well, that was cool. I never know scout ahead. Here. See what's around Stern the corner. Breach is a dangerous place, so it wants me to use my scouting mode. I guess if you wanted to, you could just sneak past these guys and not even try them. I wonder if it would give you any kind of experience points for doing that. Because usually I try to engage everything just because I want to level up as quick as possible. Oh, these guys. Now oh, I'm starting to see some of the hardness coming through here. Seems like when I play this on normal difficulty, I just walked right through this, these guys, just holding them down. I'm actually starting to take some damage. You see that, that red coming down is there. If that gets all the way, if their whole portrait becomes red, that means they're unconscious I can't remember what button it is I think it might be tab or I think it's tab if you hold that down it'll show you the the hot spots very useful I'm, I'm sure there must be a setting where you could even turn that feature off if you just wanted to you know pixel hunt now, this is probably about as far as you want to go if you want to avoid spoilers because there's a big one that's going to come up and you probably don't want to have it spoiled, so I would suggest skipping ahead. About the next five minutes ought to, ought to get you out of the spoiler zone. Alright, so we finally meet the older <laughs> robed man. Oathbinder, bear witness. And see this man has kept his word true to his last breath. Full 
to his blood's last drop. Guide his soul, queen that was, and regard it among your favored. Let his life by the key be his confession. Let his death by the key be his absolution. May he walk the world ever free of the crushing weight of the book. Your brother has done his part, and you have seen the power of his contribution. I will accept no further hesitation from the rest of you. In the sight of the queen that was, will you fulfill the oath? Will you take your place beside your brother in the endless esteem of her memory that is without flaw? Step forth and be assured of the great worth of your life's course. Me, me next. <laughs> oh, man. That is awesome. So that's just probably far enough, I think, with these guys. That they should give you a pretty good idea of the the flavor of the game and. You know, you've seen enough of the story, I think, to pique your interest, hopefully. It actually is a really, really good story. So I'll skip and show you a little bit of my other party. Just to show you what it's like to have a full party of uh, adventurers. So here's my first party again. This was on normal difficulty. See, I got my six characters there. All uh, pretty good NPCs. I like them. Got a cleric. A uh, eater there as a fighter. And I think, the, I forget the name of the woman there, but she's a ranger. That's, she's a pretty cool character, too. I like the way the rangers work. They have a sort of the little minion that can tackle people. Then they got the chanter. And then, of course, uh, one of the first characters you meet is the wizard. And I would, you know, I, I would recommend playing with the with these guys, or at least some uh, some of the NPCs. I know it's tempting to create your own party. But you'd miss out on some pretty cool story elements that way, I, I think. But, you know, that's always an option if you'd rather just rule your own. Maybe if you played it a few times already and you've seen the story, uh, then you could create your own party to get that sort of ultimate, you know, kick-ass party. You might actually need that for the some of those harder difficulty levels. One thing I'm a little wary of in reviewing a game like this, just I have such so much personal interest in it, and I love the... Original Baldur's Gate games, and of course this is new, and there's a lot of excitement around it. I'm a little wary of uh, making big claims, like saying this is a, a modern masterpiece, or this is better than Baldur's Gate. You know, because I, I think sometimes the only way you can really tell something like that is with time, right? You know, if I play this game, I might will people still be interested in this game ten years from now? You know, and, and have a community around it like they have around uh, Baldur's Gate today. You know, we don't know. We just have to wait and see what happens, I guess. But, uh, just my experience at this moment, I really, really like this game. I would definitely have no problem playing it all the way through again and maybe mix it up, try, try it with some different characters, maybe one of those other difficulty levels. I mean, there's lots of ways. I just don't see it getting old in, uh, in any way. Plus, there's a great deal of... Uh, there's a huge amount of lore and text, and you know, stuff to read and keep you occupied. You know, you're not going to get bored anytime soon with this. So, you know, I highly recommend it. I would go so far as to say it's about as close to the Baldur's Gate experience as you're going to get in a modern game. I would have been curious to see what they could have done if they had had, say, twice or three times their budget. You know, I'm not sure, necessarily sure that would have made for a better game or not. I'm kind of curious what you think about that. Uh, my main negatives about it, I like. I think the story's great. It's got a deep sort of philosophical bent to it, which is nice. Uh, the characters didn't really click with me as strongly as the ones in the uh, Planescape Torment or uh, Baldur's Gate series. You know, there's no character here that really stands out to me like Minsk, Minsk did, uh, for example. Or Mort, the Skull, one of my favorite RPG characters. 
Although it definitely had more character to it than the Icewind Dale series did. Uh, so it's somewhere in between those, I would say. It's also a little shorter than I expected. I, I didn't exactly uh, rush through it. I, I didn't do every side quest and sub quest. So, I mean, that could have added on some sure. signif significant length. But I was a little surprised when it ended. I thought I had <laughs> another chapter, another act left to go or something. Uh, but then it was over, so... You know that that that's fine though. You know I like if a game leaves you wanting more. I think it's that's a sign that it was a good game. <laughs> you know, I much prefer that to that. Oh God, is this thing ever going to be over? A uh, feeling that you get when they just purposefully try to drag things out. So I actually, again, no some people might look at that as a negative. Uh, I see it more as a positive. And like I said, I didn't go down every rabbit hole I could have. So uh, there's that. Um, other negatives. Just kind of little nitpicky stuff that, you know, yeah, this could have been better. This could have been better. Could have had more portraits. You know, could have had more voice samples, uh, that sort of thing. But I mean, it's just just kind of little piddly stuff, right? I mean, the fact is they've really accomplished something special here. Now, if you haven't bought the game yet, uh, you can pick it up if you will uh, from GOG.com. That way, the show match yet will get a some affiliate. Uh, rewards. Uh, they've got three different editions there, a Hero, Champion, and Royal. Hero's $45, the Champion 60 and the nope. Royal's 90 So, you know, I'll put some links in the show notes if you want to go pick one of those up. But, as always, guys, I really appreciate your watching this review, and if you have your own thoughts, of course, on the game, uh, please let me know. Share those in the comments. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with part one of a new interview series with Mr. Paul Neurath, the designer of the Ultima Underworld series. Got a really great interview uh, with him. I think you uh, will really, really enjoy that, so stay tuned. As always, I want to thank you very, very, very much if you have supported me in my efforts at preserving and celebrating video game history. So thank you very much, guys, if you have done that. If you would like to support the show yourself, just go to the Patreon link in the show notes. That will take you to a special page where you can support the show at any level that you feel comfortable with. Really, guys, a dollar, two bucks, whatever you can afford, and you think the show is worth, I greatly appreciate it. Uh, also, if you haven't bought a copy of Pillars of Eternity yet, uh, you can do so at GOG, G-O-G.com. Just use my affiliate link. Won't cost you anything extra for that, but a percentage uh, will go to the show. So uh, that's another great way to support the show and also a great way to support Obsidian. We really want this game to do really, really well, so there will be absolutely zero question about making a sequel. All right, I think that will do it. Uh, what about the news from the Matt Cave? All right, we've got some uh, three major items, I would say. I got some good news here and some bad news. I guess, uh, which do you want first? The bad news, okay. Uh, uh, the bad news is that our uh, friends at the Electronic Software Association, the ESA, have decided that uh, preserving old video games by circumventing the copy protection is a form of hacking, and it encourages piracy, so they're trying to put a clamp down on it. So as you know, there's a lot of sites out there that are trying to, uh, you know, uh, museums, galleries, that sort of thing, uh, at conventions and shows, and they basically want ways for new people, or kids maybe, to be able to play these games. Uh, of course, they won't run on the modern hardware, and uh, some of them have some pretty nasty copy protection schemes that are, you know, I guess, incompatible or whatever. Uh, so they actually will have the pirated versions, uh, the cracked versions uh, of those games and other kinds of software, and they'll be uh, using that to you know, for people to play on. Uh, apparently the ESA doesn't like that. Uh, I want to see what else uh, with this. Uh, Adam uh, from the Fragments of Silicon, uh, Silicon uh, podcast, he posted a couple other uh, additions to this. I haven't had a chance to look at those yet, but it looks like the copyright uh, office, you know, the, uh, the government, I guess, is trying to collect some comments on this. So uh, I don't quite follow it all. 
what's going on with that, but it sounds like they're at least uh, considering some possibilities, some, some exemptions maybe for this kind of stuff. So anyways, keep your eye on that. Uh, maybe you can actually intervene somehow, encourage a <laughs> congressperson to actually uh, do something good uh, for us and see, but make sure we can continue to pr preserve these games. Yeah, I can barely talk today. Uh, another piece of news, this is uh, better. Uh, David Craddock, you may remember him. We, I did a series of interviews him with him. I don't know, maybe just one interview with him about his book on uh, Diablo history. Well, he's launching a new, a new book. It's not out quite yet. I guess it's going to be out in June. It says here June 29th, so not, not too far off. It's called Dungeon Hacks. That will be the evolution of the roguelike. It will be available in paperback and ebook form. So he said he would send me a copy of this uh, to read and, of course, a review, let you guys know what I think about it. Uh, I'm, I'm expecting some pretty good things from it. You know, David, I really liked his uh, other book. Uh, so let's uh, stay tuned for that. I'll put a link to his site in the show notes for you. Uh, also, uh, last but not least, there is a new C64 game coming out. It's uh, in development now, is my understanding. It's by Papa Sanford, Santor, Santord. I think it's his name. I can't read my own handwriting. Uh, but that is a game called, it's either Maggot or Majo. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. M-A-G-O-T. Uh, and that's going to be on floppy and cart. It looks like it's going to be a fixed screen shoot 'em up kind of game. It'll look pretty cool. I know you guys would be excited about this. A new C64 game. You know, that's something you don't see every day. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that everybody knew about that. I know a lot of you guys are fans of the old C64. It'll be fun for, I'm going to see if I can get a copy too. A little different than uh, the typical Matt Chat Fair, but uh, it could be fun. Yeah, maybe those guys will send me a copy. Anyway, uh, what about that ale of the week? Well, you know, uh, to kind of to celebrate the Pillars of Eternity uh, review, I wanted to get a really, really good good ale. So I went to I want to spare no expense. I think this was something like uh, eight dollars for this. So I mean, it wasn't crazy, but it does look very, very special. This is Stone. Uh, brewery. Uh, these guys do the Arrogant Bastard, uh, one of my favorites. They do a really good uh, IPA. Uh, let's see, where are these guys out of? Stone Brewing Company out of uh, San Diego, California. So you guys ought to be able to find this one. Uh, let's see what else. They got a huge write-up on the bottle. Let's see, seventh, what is this? 736, it's like a story about the ale. We're not going to read all that to you. Take take forever and probably violate some copyright. Uh, speaking of copyrights, uh, anyway, this is the Old Guardian Extra Hoppy Barley Wine Style Ale. Now, as you know, I'm a big fan of the barley wine style, and I'm a big fan of Stone, and I like uh, Extra Hoppy. So this, you know, this is checking all of my boxes. I'm really excited about this. It is a 2015 odd year release. And it is 11% alcohol by volume, so definitely on the strong side. See if it tastes much, how much of that alcohol will be in the taste. Let's see, anything else? <laughs> I probably should have read this huge write-up uh, to learn more about it, but uh, oh well. Anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Old Guardian Extra Hoppy here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Smells really, really hoppy indeed. I can almost taste the hops just by smelling it, which is a pretty interesting sensation. Definitely smelling some sort of cocoa, a little bit of a, a nutty-like aroma to this. Uh, uh, it smells pretty good. and I'm not really smelling a barley wine. This smells more like an IPA to me at the, at the moment, but I mean, let's give it a try. Maybe it'll taste different than it smells. <coughs> uh, let's try it again. <laughs> Ooh, but that really. Uh, now I'm. Uh, anyway, this one really packs a packs a wallop. Let me tell you, and you get a really strong sort of cherry, uh, almost a bourbony bourbon like. Cherries and bourbon, really a bitter, uh, really like really dark coffee kind of bitter. You know, it's uh, it's a, <laughs> this is pungent. Ugh, you definitely do not do not chug 
This one, <laughs> probably pass out to try that. Let me take another. Should I do? <laughs> I'm try it one more time here. Well, that is, that's, uh, that'll put some hair on your chest. <clears throat> very strong, very bitter. Uh, wow. Uh, they're not, definitely not kidding around about it being hoppy. It's uh, actually not bad. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's going to get your attention right there. Um, you, definitely, you don't really taste the alcohol so much as just a really strong flavor to this. It's kind of a little smoky, too. It's, uh, like I said, not something you'd want to chug. I don't know what to to make of it really it's it's very interesting uh, taste wise I mean you could have a lot of fun uh, letting people taste it it's a uh, it's almost like a what is that it really tastes almost like a scotch like a little uh, glass of scotch on this um, anyway really don't know what to do with this I'm gonna go uh, I guess uh, I guess I'll go four out of five drinking horns I'm almost thinking three out of five uh, it's not something I would, you know, seek out and want to try again, <laughs> necessarily. Uh, but, you know, I will give them credit. It, it definitely stands out. It really gets your attention. And if you like something really bitter and really hoppy, you know, you'd probably love this. A little bit more uh, bitter than I like to go. And I don't really taste the sort of barley wine uh, flavors. At least it's not what I am used to as far as barley wines are concerned. A little, I kind of like a little bit more of a, you know... Uh, Oh, those are a little bit sweeter, seems to me, uh, than this one is. But anyway, it is what it is. Old Guardian Extra Hoppy. I'll go uh, four out of five uh, drinking horns on this. Uh, definitely, it's worth a try. You know, you might like it. Be curious to know what your responses are. <laughs> you should videotape them, too. I'd like to see the response. I think that would be pretty fun. Anyway, uh, let's wrap this up before I uh, have some kind of seizure. Uh, this is from a quote. I've been reading some a lot of Conan Conan novels lately. I've always kind of been a fan, and I got some a pretty good deal on a big stack of them, so I've been really enjoying those. Uh, Robert E. Howard. Uh, I love the guy. I love the guy's work. Some people don't. <laughs> I don't know why, but anyway, he, he writes a lot of poems, and uh, this was one uh, from the book I'm reading, and I just thought I would share it with you. It's, it's just a really fun uh, poem and a good book, too. Anyway, it goes something like this. What do I know of cultured ways, the guilt, the craft, and the lie? I, who was born in a naked land and bred in the open sky, the subtle tongue, the sophist guile, they fail when the broadswords sing, rush in and die, dogs, I was a man before I was a king. <laughs> Whew, great stuff. Anyway, see you guys next week. Conan, what is best in life? To crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and to hear the lamentation of your women. That is good. That is good.